American history, especially the story of the American Revolution, has often been neglected in textbooks published in classrooms for almost half a century. If you asked most Americans to discuss the Revolution, they would start with Lexington and Concord, fair enough, then go to Bunker Hill, Saratoga, and Yorktown, the end. Now, in general American histories, and especially in textbooks, 20th and 21st century historians, for the most part, consider the war in the South to be a sideshow. But somehow, it all ended up at Yorktown. The revolution about which they write is not an American revolution. Instead, it is primarily a New England revolution with just a small passing nod to the Middle Atlantic colonies. Now, I know there are excellent monographs and studies of the war in the South, but it's from most general histories and texts that Americans, and particularly school children, get their history. I've spent the last decade or so sampling textbooks which two generations of students have used, and it's not an encouraging scene, either from a regional or a national level. One American history text published in the last century, late, devoted only five pages to the American Revolution, three to social and political issues, and just two to the war itself. A more recent text, published at the turn of this century, of 976 pages, had just four to the war itself, a sequence that is introduced by the sentence, the course of the war is soon told. What an understatement. The same author dismissed the battles of King's Mountains, Cowpens, and Guilford Courthouse as being neither decisive nor particularly important. Now, there are other examples, but generally in textbooks, it's two to one, Northern Campaign, the war in the North, the independence movement in the North, as opposed to what is in the South. Now, the Southern Campaign was crucial to what happened in the American Revolution. There's a reason why Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. The war just didn't jump from Saratoga to Yorktown. Now, in the American South, there had been considerable in the Southern colonies, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, had been revolutionary activity in battles in 1775 and 1776. But between 76 and 78, there wasn't much military action in the South. Most of it was in the Middle Atlantic uh, and the North. But because of English politics, all of that was going to be changed. First of all, there was growing opposition to the war uh, in England. Lord North, the Prime Minister, his government needed a big victory. And he thought that victory could be had in the South. Now, why all of a sudden, after spending two years uh, chasing General Washington up north, do you decide that the South is going to be the primary focus of the British war effort. First of all, King George III was convinced that there were lots of loyalists in the South. In fact, he is quoted on several occasions as saying, North Carolina is his most loyal colony. All they needed, he kept telling Lord North, is for the British government to send troops and ships and then thousands would come out of the woodwork or out of the woods and openly show their support for the king. The southern coastline made it very easy to use the Royal Navy in support of military operations. And that's something you need to consider. You could move troops. You could also bring in uh, battleships in the case of harbors like Charleston for basically artillery support. And also, something that is totally neglected, but I think crucially important, is that the southern colonies were the most important in North America economically in terms of trade with the mother country. By 1770, the value of just South Carolina's exports alone to England were 29% of the value of trade in the empire. One of the smallest colonies had almost 30% of the value of exports. You throw in Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, and it gets probably close to half, if not more than half, of the value of exports. And the three wealthiest areas in North America in the 13 original colonies were all located in the South, in South Carolina, Maryland, and Virginia. 
English generals over here bought into the, the plan, Sir Henry Clinton and Lord Cornwallis. And they did come up with a plan. They called it the Grand, Grand Campaign, the Great Campaign, the Southern Campaign. It's got several names in their correspondence. But they did have a plan. And the plan was first to take Savannah in Georgia, and then one by one they would roll up the southern colonies, and once they got to Virginia, the revolution would, they had what they wanted, they'd declare the war over, and that would be that. Would be that. Take Savannah, then the interior of the colony, and quite frankly, Georgia was very lightly populated, so beyond Savannah, there was a place, a little town of Ebenezer, and then you've got Augusta, but there's not a tremendous, not a large population. So do that, restore royal government. That was a key part of it. You put the locals back in charge, more or less. And after Georgia was back in the empire, then the army would roll northward, and the loyalists in the Carolinas and Virginia would appear. And in more than one piece of correspondence, the king, Lord North, and the generals all believed the war would be over. 